Welcome to Where Are They Now, where we reach into the archives of Lenape, Shawnee, Cherokee, and Seneca High Schools and invite selected alumni to share their memories and fill us in on their career paths after commencement. Since Lenape's first graduating class in 1961, Shawnee's in 1972, Cherokee's in 1978, and Seneca's in 2005, over 77,000 individuals have received diplomas from these four schools. Join us now for another Lenape District alumni interview on Where Are They Now? Hello and welcome to another edition of Where Are They Now? I'm Mark Sonsini, a 1996 graduate of Cherokee High School, and today we'll be talking with a Shawnee alumnus from the class of 2007. He is a film and television editor residing in Los Angeles, California. I'd like to welcome Greg Lewis to the show. Greg, welcome. Hello, Mark. Great to have you here today. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited to uh, hear about your career in TV and film. But first, let's go back and take a look at your time at Shawnee before we do that. You grew up here in Medford? Absolutely. I spent my whole life in Medford. Excellent. And let's talk about some of the activities you were involved in at Shawnee. You were in uh, wrestling. Did you? Was that all four years or just a couple of years? I only wrestled for one year. OK. And. I have to say, um, I was not very good at it, but I stuck <laughs> with it. And you know, I, I, I look back on, on it, and you know, it really it, it was an interesting time because I, I think it's really kind of a good lesson that you know, I wasn't always in my comfort zone, but I mm -hmm. stuck with it. And in retrospect, I would have been really, really disappointed if I quit. Yeah. And so I'm glad that even if I wasn't always 100% into it that I at least went through it and completed it. Today. Sure, that's good. It's one of those important lessons that you learn in high school. Um, now, a couple of the activities you were yeah. really interested in and definitely stuck with, uh, one was Shawnee TV Tech, and sort of as a byproduct of that, you were an intern right here at LDTV. So tell us about those experiences. Yeah, so you know, I got started with media production work in middle school at uh, Memorial Middle uh, School. Sherman Ebison uh, or Mrs. Ebison ran a program there for some of the students, and that's gotten involved with it. And so it felt natural to proceed with that in Shawnee. And so I did the Shawnee TV Tech program with uh, Mr. Capello there and did the classes. I was involved with the morning show that they produced um, and then eventually ended up working uh, with you all at LDTV. So tell me about, you mentioned Mr. Capello at Shawnee. Steve Capello is the uh, TV, television technology teacher there. Uh, tell us about having him as a teacher and the influence he had on you. Mr. Capello was a fantastic teacher, one of the best that I have ever had because he you know, he was tough but fair with the students. Um, there wasn't unnecessary coddling. He was honest about our work. Mm -hmm. And if we gained his trust, he really did let us have some freedom. Um, during that time, you know, we didn't all have video cameras on our cell phones. Right. Uh, every laptop could not edit a video. And so he really did give us the freedom if we earned the trust to use the equipment how we wanted to, to spend extra hours in the video editing lab that they had there and just give us the freedom to, uh, you know, explore, how, uh, develop our own creative voices and see what within the world of media we were interested in. And as far as exploring different things, he was one of the ones that kind of pushed you towards doing the internship here at Lenape District Television, right? Um, yeah, I, I would say more than kind of. He, he really pushed me into doing it. Uh, he was pretty animate that it would sort of be like a jump start on my first year of college. And yeah, I, I was really kind of unsure about it because to do the internship there, it replaced some classes that I had at Shawnee. Right. And so it was time out of high school, time away from my friends that uh, you know we were all going to be going to different colleges soon. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed like a big leap. Um, in retrospect, I'm really, really glad that I did. Did you find that it, it did give you a jump start when you went into uh, your first year of college, which we'll talk about in a minute? 
Oh, oh, absolutely. You learn more and more and more the more you have access to, the more people that you have access to, the more equipment that you have access to. And so at, at Shawnee, I really learned a lot about operating in a studio environment. And then with you all at LDTV, we were working on all of the sports games out in the field. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, it was a completely different environment and new people, new software. Um, Mark, you actually taught me something in Avid Media oh. Composer that <laughs> I still do to this day. And I still think of you when it comes up. What is that? I don't even. Um, so when you bring in a still piece of video, it has a time code embedded in it. And if your endpoint is on the first frame of it, there's no media before it to actually work with. So you can't right. roll or slip the edit. Um, and so when you're working with still media, you want to move your endpoint to somewhere in the middle of the clip. And that has actually since been corrected in some software, but some, sometimes it is not. Uh, and so it's just a good force of habit that when you're working with still media to do that. Uh, because we were working on, there was a new student handbook. Okay. And we took a bunch of scans of the handbook and did an explainer video of what was new and what was different with it. Okay. And um, yeah, I, I ran into some technical problems uh, from not changing the endpoint and then wanting to change keyframes after the fact. Uh, gotcha. So uh, you still have an almost daily influence on, on my work life. <laughs> That's so nice, thank you, Greg. I, I had no yeah. idea, but I'm glad it's helped you out along the way. Yeah. Um, so one of the other teachers I don't, uh, we, we don't want to miss uh, at Shawnee that had, had an impact on you was Tim Moran for English. Tell us about him. Yes, Tim Moran was, a, I think, a, a very unique teacher. I look back on you know, the plethora of te teachers that I've had throughout my education and there's just there was something about his teaching style that was just very intellectual, very mm -hmm. academic. And I think back to what we discussed in his class, and it most resembles a college class out of anything that I had done in high school. Um, he, he was a literature teacher, and you know we learned a lot about archetypes and how those archetypes can be used to develop stories and very quickly, tap into other cultural influences to build a story, to build a narrative based on preconceived notions that other people have. And I, yeah, I, I, I really just look back like, at it as, you know, just, he was such a smart teacher and he was really good at, uh, you know, tapping into students' um, interests and engaging them. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I remember uh, years ago, Tim since retired now, but we, recorded some video in his class, and I thought many of the same things um, that you're mentioning here, the way he taught, it was very, it was very much like a college setting, so yes. yes. Okay, so after you graduate Shawnee, you're headed off to Emerson College in Boston. Tell us about that. You're going in for uh, visual media arts and a focus on digital post-production. Yes, so after Shawnee, I went into Emerson College. Uh, I had spent my entire life in Medford up until that point um, on, you know, on the same street in Medford, same house. <laughs> and so it was definitely a big leap going from Medford uh, into a, a, a city. Fortunately, Boston, I like to call it a good starter city because it is very, very small. <laughs> Okay. And so it, it, it was a big change, but uh, it was a fantastic time. Um, Emerson has a fairly renowned uh, media program. Um, anything you can think of really within the media and communications field, they, they have. And so very, very early on in my education at uh, Shawnee, I identified that I wanted to work in editing. There's just okay. something about the process that enamored me. I loved the technology, I loved the art of it, I loved the, the whole thing. And so the entire time that I was at Emerson, I had a focus on editing and post-production. And so that was my specialization within the larger media major there. And I spent a good deal of my time focusing on that. So that involved editing student films, putting a lot of time into editing, um, projects for classes, including helping other people with it, and also working in the post-production lab that the school had. It was a time where it was very, very hard to edit a project on your laptop. So yeah. the school has a post-production lab that people would go on to use their computers. Okay. And students were employed at this lab to 
basically sit there and troubleshoot and help students when technical problems came up. Okay. And I mean, it was, you learn a lot from editing your own projects and coming across your own mistakes, but you learn even more when you're coming across everybody's mistakes. Yeah. And so throughout my four years at Emerson doing that, it was, I mean, it was basically a master class in the technical side of editing. There was a single problem that you did not encounter, not a single personality type that you did not encounter. Uh, yeah, so the, the people in the, in the lab were, were called labbies. Okay. And there's, there's a ton of us out in Los Angeles now. A lot of us have worked with or for each other. I hired other labbies from Emerson. <laughs> and it's one of those things where when you, when you see it on a resume, you know the experiences that that person has, has gone through. Right. And you know that they would not stay in that job if they did not know what they were doing. <laughs> Very good. So you, you know you've got a good candidate there when you see that. Um, Absolutely. And you had an opportunity at Emerson also to spend a semester out in L.A. Tell us about that experience. Yes. Yeah, so Emerson College has a semester in Los Angeles, and uh, it might not seem as exotic as a you know, semester in Europe or elsewhere <laughs> in the world, uh, but Boston and Los Angeles are very, very different cities. Um, so it, it, it was definitely taking people out of what they're they're used to and so it's pretty much everybody in the media programs at the school applies to it and they accept 100 students um, I was fortunate enough to um, you know have the right recommendation and uh, I guess have a d decent application and so I was accepted to the program I did my final semester of school in Los Angeles uh, with the intent of staying afterwards okay uh, which I, I did end up doing and I've uh, I've been there pretty much every day since. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up interning for a studio called Vuguru. I um, had never heard of them before. They were pretty much a small startup operation. I, I applied to it on a day that I applied to 12 internships and I didn't even remember uh, ha having applied to them. They didn't have a website yet. So I didn't even <laughs> really know who they were when they contacted me. Okay. Uh, but I went in, I spoke with them and it seemed like a really, really good company to get involved with. They were small. They were just getting off the ground. Mm -hmm. And it, I was really, it, it was, you know, it, it was actually pretty similar to interning at uh, LDTV where like there weren't a lot of walls. Mm -hmm. I could get involved with whatever I wanted to get involved with. And so I think I was only supposed to be there three days a week uh, based on my intern, you know, the, the like, minimum requirement of the, the internship right and towards the end of it i was there pretty much six days a week helping them with whatever they needed help with and it was a fantastic group of people and at the end of my internship they ended up hiring me and i came on the board uh onto the team as a post-production assistant okay. um and throughout my I worked there for three years. I worked my way up to uh, running the post-production department uh, as the manager of post-production. And that's probably one of the benefits of going to a smaller and even in this case, a, you know, a, a newly formed uh, company as an internship is that you, you get a lot of opportunities. You know, the name might not be something that people know, but you're gaining a lot of experience rather than going to a big name uh, you know, company and not really doing much that's gaining you experience. Do you agree with that? Exactly, and that's sort of what I identified because I, I kind of saw for the people that just want free labor, there's no room for growth. They're not going to hire you afterwards. Then there's kind of the small operation where you know if you have, I'd say under 30 people, there's a lot going on, but there still isn't a large uh, like institution there. Um, and then you have the very, very large companies. I mean, there were people that interned for large media networks, um, right. the biggest studios you could imagine. And those are a bit more like assembly line positions where there's always an intern and there's things that that intern always does. And so like, I, I just, I identified that that smaller operation was kind of the best place to be. Okay. And it, it, that was my hunch. And it, it turned out uh, re really being so. You're there for three years. And then uh, you have an opportunity with Nickelodeon Animation. Tell us how that came about. Yeah, so I had been there for three years, um, and it just it kind of felt like it was time to move on. Um, okay. I was 
in my career path, I was sort of at the highest place I could have gone at the company. And fortunately, a lot of people that I worked with there also had previously worked for Nickelodeon. And so a, a lot of it, you know, is kind of who you know. And sure. they were able to open that door for me when I saw a job posting for uh, a post-production manager job at Nickelodeon that was doing exactly what I was doing for, for this other studio, uh, but at Nickelodeon on a series, a preschool series called Shimmer and Shine uh, okay. that was just getting off the ground. And so I, I never watched watch an animation before. I had really had no strong pull to work in animation, okay. but it seemed like an amazing opportunity to try something new and I did it. Awesome. So you end up, you're staying with Nickelodeon for about three years. Tell us about some of the other projects that you worked on during your time there. As I mentioned before, I always wanted to get into editorial and it was always my goal from the very beginning. And so right when I started working at Nickelodeon, you know, I identified this is a place that employs a lot of editors. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to leverage my connections uh, um, to like grow into that role. And so I worked as a post-production manager there for a year and beyond doing my job, I also just tried to network with as many editors at the studio as possible. Um, okay. Going to their office to chat, getting lunch with them, getting coffee, like whatever I could do to yeah. let people know that, you know, I had this baseline skill set, mm -hmm. and it was an interest of mine. And so eventually an opportunity at the studio opened up on a Christmas movie called Albert and they only needed somebody for three months. Mm -hmm. And so I was right at a juncture where Shimmer and Shine had been picked up for another season. It was going to be a solid year plus of work guaranteed. Okay. Or I could take this editor position that would only last three months. And it was a terrible time. I was about to get married. Uh, it really seemed like a bad time to not have a stable job. Yeah. But I kind of had to reflect a little bit of you know, since I was in Memorial Middle School with Miss Everson, what was it that I wanted to do with my career? Did I want to be a manager or did I want to be an editor? Okay. And so I kind of just had to jump in with both feet and I took the role and uh, it was my first editor position. I didn't always know the specific, because editing animation is very, very specific and there's a lot of uh, unique functions that you that you have to do if you're editing animation versus uh, you know footage with people in it like we're uh, right. you know like, like us right now yeah uh, and so it, it was tough it was challenging but I got through it and I've been working as an editor pretty much every day since. So tell us a little bit about editing animation and you don't have to get into the nuts and bolts of it but just kind of make sense for it for people who don't know like what how is what does editing animation involve, in, in, especially in what you were doing for Albert and some of the other projects? People think of making a film as you, you shoot it first and then you edit it. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you often think of somebody editing as uh, going through a tranche of footage and you know, building this perfect piece of media from the materials that they had. Right. Uh, with animation, it's actually the reverse of it where you edit it first and then you shoot it. So it's very time consuming and very expensive to produce animation. And so what you what you do is you create, they're called animatics. Um, they're just very, very quickly drawn versions of the story. And so in an animatic, you are working out everything. The shot length, the shot compositions, the dialogue, the overall structure of the story, um, generally what things are going to look like. And so every animated production that you've seen has some sort of very rough cartoon of it made. And so a, a, a very, very important part of editing animation is working on that pre-production product. So that when you actually push it into animation, you're only animating what you actually need for the final product. And d d depending on the production, sometimes that is its own job other time uh, where you just work on the animatic. I've had productions where I've done that. And then there are other times where the editor stays with the project all the way through production. So okay. what that entails is often, you know, while it's being animated, there's not much editorial work, but 
as a senior creative member of the team, you are often evaluating other people's work. You're commenting on the animation, the camera work, how everything is flowing together. Okay. And then towards the end of the process, there is a final edit pass of the movie done where you can tighten up shots, you can restructure stories and move scenes around um, sure. and just play with the cut in any way that you can. You take a chance on Albert, as you said, and kind of leaving something that you knew you, you, you had a, a comfortable position in. You take a chance, do Albert. What happens after that when that's finished? Albert was a fantastic project because, as I said, I was only supposed to be on it for three months, and I ended up on it for a year uh, <laughs> just because uh, this was a big project for Nickelodeon. Okay. This was the first, uh, first movie that the Nickelodeon Animation Studio was specifically producing. Okay. And so they wanted it to be good. They wanted it to be great. And the story just wasn't ready yet. And so I ended up on the project for a solid year. Uh, and I was also about to be done with it, not really sure what I was going to do. And that's when I um, sort of haphazardly joined Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because one of um, they were on the same floor that we were in, and I had spoken to one of the editors on that uh, show, just getting coffee um, in in the break room. Okay. And she was about to leave the position. She wanted to be able to recommend someone to it um, to kind of soften the blow of of her, of her leaving. Okay. And I was the only person she knew that wasn't going to have a job soon. And uh, so she recommended me for it, and I ended up just uh, going straight over over to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. All right. Yeah. See, those conversations around the water cooler are invaluable. Sometimes. It, they, they, yeah, they actually <laughs> do amount to something. Uh, okay. So you do Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Adventures of Kid Danger is another one people probably know for Nickelodeon. Um, yes. And what were those kind of the same roles? They were slightly different roles. So with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I was only involved with the animatics, um, okay. the early pre-production stage. When you work as an editor, you very rarely have a stable job. You work project to project. Yeah. And typically, if a project's over, then you, you, know, you have to find another job. Uh, so Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was actually my last production working directly for Nickelodeon. Um, and then the Adventures of Kid Danger was at a other studio named Powerhouse Animation. Okay. Uh, but they were producing the show for Nickelodeon, which made me an ideal candidate for it. And that was one production that I stayed with throughout the entire show. So I was editing the early pre-production phases, but then also staying with it through animation. And you know that was a really, really fun show to edit because it is simpler 2D animation. Okay. which ends up being more of a challenge for editorial because you can do things like cut characters out and reposition them if there's a solid background. Mm -hmm. um, if I froze on screen, you would notice it, but most animated characters aren't moving every frame. So right. you can freeze them, you can run the animation backwards, and the footage is just a lot more malleable than you might actually think it, it was after it's already been animated. So I... I love editing simple 2D animation for that reason. Interesting. Um, okay, so you mentioned Powerhouse, and that's where you are now. And tell us about your most recent project that you worked on, Blood of Zeus. Yes, so I, I did a series that was produced for the Netflix anime division called Blood of Zeus. And uh, it is a Greek god mythology story told uh, in somewhat of an anime style. So uh, one of the interesting things about Greek mythology is it is an oral tradition. There wasn't, um, everything that was written down was written down years later. And so one of the intriguing things about that is that there are almost inevitably hundreds, if not thousands of stories of Greek mythology that were lost. And so what the writers of this project did and did successfully is try to tell a new story within the existing confines of what we know of Greek mythology. Okay. And so it, it followed this, uh, this character named Heron, who was, uh, Zeus had a lot of sons, um, as a lot of us know. And so this was one of his sons that didn't make it 
into the records. Okay. Uh, and so it, it was just like a really, really creative, fun story. Uh, and uh, you know, up until this point, I had mainly done children's content. Uh, and with the title like Blood of Zeus, I'm sure you can imagine uh, this was anything but that. Uh, and so because well, yeah, when you end up working in animation, you're sort of, uh, you know, you, you expect to work on children's content. Yeah. It was nice to work on something that was a little bit more open where you weren't as limited to what you could or could not show. Sure. Um, and the show was hugely successful when it was released. It was on uh, the Netflix top 10 for quite some time. Um, and they announced that they're going to be making more of it as well, uh, which, which is very exciting. Fantastic. And the success was a little unexpected, right? Yeah, you know, it, it was absolutely unexpected. Um, anyone who's produced a show for Netflix or been involved with it, um, it, it it's very nerve wracking pre-release because mm -hmm. they don't do a lot of marketing for most of the shows. Okay. It's kind of sink or swim. If the audience likes it, they will make more of it. And um, if they don't, uh, it goes away. And so there are shows that have been made in a pretty similar style to ours that just go up, nobody watches them, and then they go away. And so we were all just very surprised. Um, there's not, I mean, there's amazing talent on the project, but there weren't those huge names that you expect to really draw people in that you can yeah. market with. Uh, and so, yeah, we were, we were all very, very surprised. Uh, and I mean, it is a good quality show, but sometimes good and quality doesn't make it right. to the top. Yeah. Um, and I mean, we all, we all poured our heart and souls into it. There were many nights at the office where we were there until three, 4 AM. Uh, I actually, uh, I would feel bad sometimes because I would leave at 3 AM and there would still be people there. <laughs> and there was a period of time on the production that, uh, so as, as an editor, you host a lot of reviews in your office okay. because part of the job is leading the review of new content and new footage that's coming in. And so I had three couches in my office so that everybody could fit in. And there was a period of time in production that I just expected in the morning to find three people sleeping on my couches when I opened <laughs> my door. <laughs> Well, I'm glad it, it got the uh, the recognition and the accolades that uh, it did, because I know, yeah, that there's nothing worse than spending, you know, a lot of time and pouring your heart and soul into something and people, you know, not uh, seeing it or not recognizing it. So I'm glad that worked out for you. Thank um, you. So tell us, what, we're at the time we're shooting this now, we had hoped that you were going to be able to tell us about a couple of the upcoming projects you're working on. You can't tell us a whole lot, but tell us what you can about what you're working on next. Yeah, so yeah, unfortunately the past, I want to say two years of my work is um, still kind of held under lock and key, uh, but I did edit uh, an independent animated film that will hopefully be released soon. Um, there's, they're looking at some uh, international distribution, but we're hoping that it will be in the US soon. Okay. Um, and currently I am working for DreamWorks Television on uh, an unannounced series for Netflix. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I can say it is, uh, it's one of DreamWorks' larger uh, intellectual properties. And so hopefully right. uh, everybody should um, have heard of it uh, when it comes out. Okay. Uh, I've, I've been working on it for about a year and a half now. Uh, and it's just been an amazing experience working for DreamWorks. Uh, it feels lame to call it a dream, but it kind of is. Uh, yeah. I mean, they really, really support the artists and technicians that work there and give you just the tools and resources and time that you need to mm -hmm. make an amazing product. And because like at the end of the day, like that's why we all do what we do is I, I love everything about editing. I love playing with the technology. I love uh, the interplay between uh, myself and the other artists on the show. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you're not making a quality product, it's kind of all for nothing. And so, I mean, they really do everything in their power to make sure that what is coming out of that studio is top notch the best uh content out there and like i'm really really excited the show might not come out for about another year uh okay. but i'm i've already seen some final footage for it and this, i am so excited for it to be released excellent we're looking forward to it too i know i think of dreamworks i think of shrek uh that's just me but you know we'll have to see 
what happens. But we're definitely looking forward to seeing your work coming up. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your life outside of work. Uh, you're married to your wife, Gabrielle. Tell us how you guys met. Gabrielle is, uh, I live in Los Angeles now, um, but uh, she is uh, part of my uh, connection to New Jersey. Is uh, She was from Cherry Hill, uh, went to Cherry Hill East. And we just met through mutual friends that we had outside of school. Okay. And yeah, so we, we met in high school and um, are, you know, have now been married for five years. And, um, you know, I, I actually, I, I somewhat credit uh, my internship with LDTV as uh, <laughs> helping us form our early relationship. Cause I just, I had more freedom. I had more independence in my schedule. Um, and so it, it really, it, you know, it, it when you're living, you know, when you're in high school, someone who lives, you know, 30 minutes away from you, like that's, that's forever. That's far. Uh, right? not, th yeah, that's for, not to mention that I routinely drive double that uh, to get to work <laughs> nowadays. Uh, but, you know, it just, it seems like it's so far. And so the independence that, uh, you know, having the internship and being involved with that program did, I really think helped us solidify our relationship in those very, very early days. Well, that's great. Here at LDTV, you know, we provide everything from technical advice to relationship <laughs> help. You get everything. It's full no, service here. So it, no, and it, it, you know, it really is. You, you look at you know, there, there's so much there's so much that's ingrained in everybody based on where they're from, and uh, you know, Southern New Jersey is a very specific place. Uh, it's not North Jersey. <laughs> it is its own kind of thing. Yep. And so you know, there's just there's little quips and jokes that we get from each other because I mean, so much of our upbringing was similar because we're both Southern New Jersey people. Did you have to convince her to move out to California with you? Was that a, a tough sell or was she on board with that? Depends on who you ask, uh, <laughs> but it, you know, right, it was, um, so let's she, get your side she has it. a lot of it. Yeah, uh, no, but uh, she, she, my wife has um, a lot of education. Um, she is a nurse practitioner. Uh, which involves a lot of uh, advanced degrees. And so she had to go where those programs were, were for her to get the education that she needed. Okay. But once she was open and once she was free, uh, it was a no brainer that she was going to come to uh, Los Angeles and uh, move in with me. And you know, she, she took a pretty big leap. Uh, she had never been to the apartment that uh, I, I had gotten because I, you know, I was living in a house with a bunch of guys before right. then, and so when she moved out, I, you know, got uh, us our, you know, first one room apartment together, and you know, she made the leap. She had never been there before. Uh, she'd only been to Los Angeles once, like years earlier, uh, and you know, she took the leap, and uh, I think it ended up working out. How was it when she first saw the apartment? Was she like, this has got to go, that's got to go, we're repainting this? No, or? no, and it, 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 it's so funny because. Uh, you know, now I, I look back at it and I was like, God, that apartment was just like pretty, pretty dirty. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, I mean, she loved it. it, it you know, it was, uh, you know, her first like real apartment. And, uh, you know, it was where we started our, our, our life together. Yeah. And so it was, you know, we didn't see the, uh, the awful kitchen cabinets. We just saw the beginning of our life together. Right. As it should be. Good. Yes. Um, <laughs> One of the activities you guys like to do together is uh, rock climbing and cycling. Um, tell us about how you got involved in those and some of the places that you've been to do that. Yeah, so cycling's been uh, not only a lifelong passion of mine, but it's just something that's ingrained in my family. My father, all of my uncles are uh, very, very into cycling. So it was something that I grew up with. Um, okay. You know, I participated in uh you guys have the, the ms 150 uh the city shore ride um mm -hmm. in south jersey yep. uh where i forget exactly where it starts but basically you, you you go all the way to the you bike all the way from uh the western end of new jersey to uh the, the eastern end ending at the shore right. uh it's uh, 75 miles one way so I, I had done that a lot uh while i was in shawnee um and you know I, i've continued that tr that trend now um so i'm pretty avid mountain biker i was mountain biking yesterday um just okay. in in my hometown um so i mean that, that's been fun uh but you know more recently we've uh, gotten pretty into rock climbing and that's 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 been an exciting thing because it, it's taken us all all over the world at this point yeah um be it specifically for climbing or uh, us working it in on another vacation and so 
you know, we've been rock climbing in Germany, Switzerland, uh, and Japan at this point. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's so much fun. It's such an amazing activity. Uh, it's only now more recently come into the mainstream. Uh, climbing was in the Olympics for the first time this past year. And now it seems like every city and town has their own climbing gym opening up in it. And so I highly recommend it. It is an amazing uh, activity. It's amazing, you know, just bonding to do with someone to somewhat uh, be dependent on their, their life uh, yes. in, in, in your hands. <laughs> And I mean, I highly recommend everybody try it. It is, it can be very, very safe if you do it right. It's not as dangerous as it, as it might sound. Okay. Um, and like, I just, I wouldn't have traded those experiences that I've had for anything. And anywhere on the bucket list that you want to go that you haven't been to yet? Everywhere. Um, I, you know, it's, it's funny because you, know, you go on a vacation and you don't get to do everything that you wanted to do. Sure. And so I want to go back to some of these places, okay. but there's also just so much of the world that I haven't seen. Yeah. So, you know, we really, we want to go to Australia. We want to go to, you know, do it like the Australia, Singapore, New Zealand thing. Uh, I've, I've, uh, through my time in animation, I've worked with a lot of people in Vietnam and, um, Bangkok as well. And so I would like to take a trip to those places for vacation and then possibly see some of the, uh, international people that I have worked with at uh, Partner and Vendor Studios. All right, aside from uh, family and things like that, and what do you miss most about South Jersey? Certain type of food, uh, something else? What, what would you say you miss the most? So it's not necessarily a certain type of food, but all of the food. People <laughs> in South Jersey do not know that they actually have the best of everything there. Um, all right. If you go to an Italian restaurant, for example, in California, you, you won't even recognize it as Italian food. The pizza, <laughs> terrible. Uh, I, I really, I, I've, I've, I have this debate on a weekly basis with people. Bagels, just if you live in Los Angeles and you want a good bagel, your best bet is to just leave Los Angeles and go somewhere else. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's the, the food there is phenomenal and you know, people don't know what you're saying if you say hoagie in Los Angeles, it's just yeah. like not a word that people know. <laughs> um, so just say sandwich if you're ever in Los Angeles and okay. you, people might be able to point you in the right direction. Sounds good. Um, aside from uh, traveling, any uh, plans for the future, aspirations career-wise or otherwise? You know, I, I think for the future, um, you know, I, I have some I will be working for DreamWorks for another uh, six months or so, and then I'm going to be moving on to another project. Okay. I don't know what that is yet, but with uh, what they're calling the streaming wars uh, with Netflix and Amazon and HBO yep. Max and all of the new streaming platforms, there is so much content. There's more content being produced now than ever before. Yeah. And um, pretty much everybody that I know is, uh, including myself, is approached about a project that somebody wants to steal them for on almost a monthly basis. And so I don't know exactly what I will be doing yeah. after my current production, but I am excited to move on to uh, bigger things. Yes. And um, like, I don't know what that will be yet, but myself and a lot of other people are really like well placed uh, to really move up and do bigger and bigger and better projects. Excellent. Well, we can't wait to see what uh, you've got coming out for us next. And uh, Greg, we wish you a lot of uh, congratulations on all your success uh, since your time at Shawnee. And we're super proud of you as an LDTV uh, alum. So uh, it's just been great talking to you today. And we really thank you for uh, joining us on the show. It's been great chatting with you, Mark. And that's all for this episode of Where Are They Now? For other Lenape District alumnus interviews, check us out online at youtube.com slash Lenape District TV. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.